So, um, like I said, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Megan. I am one of the advisors in the College of Science and Math Student Services Office, where we also do all of our pre-health professions advising. Um, and we have um, two panelists today. Unfortunately, our third couldn't make it again, like I said before. Um, and Dr. Carter and Dr. Lopes will introduce themselves shortly. Um, Connor is a student peer advisor in the um, student services office advising um, lower division first and second year students um, on health professions planning and he's going to be moderating our session um, and again thank you so much to the science and math inclusion and equity fund for supporting and sponsoring this event um, is there anything else um, dr o'brant that you want to mention before we turn it over to connor and our panelists Hi there, everybody. Um, Camille Bryant, she, her pronouns, College of Science and Math Associate Dean for Student Success, Welfare, and Issues of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, Dr. Lopes and I are still kind of working out some technical difficulties with his connecting to the webinar. I'm so glad you all could be here. And I'm also grateful for the students and staff in the College of Science and Math Student Services for putting this together and to our panelists for being here. I see Dr. Lopes's video now, so that's great. And um, yes, uh, the College of Science and Math Inclusion Equity Committee was really happy to also support this webinar through our Inclusion Equity Fund. And again, apologies for the late start and a few logistical jumps, but that's kind of life, isn't it? And I think what we have to do is learn how to roll with the flow sometimes. So we are definitely rolling with some flow here. And that's all I wanna say for now. All right, thank you. So, um, Connor, I will turn it over to you. And if you want to introduce our panelists um, and get us going, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, thank you again, everyone, for being here. Uh, we're lucky today to be joined by Dr. Joy Carter, who is a forensic pathologist here in San Luis Obispo. Um, she is the first African American forensic pathologist in the US, um, or the first chief of uh, forensic pathology. And then Dr. Joel Oaks, uh, who is the chief of anesthesiology at Colquitt Medical Center in Georgia. Um, so we're very fortunate to have them both here tonight. Um, and yeah, I, I don't wanna take up too much time. So um, Dr. Joy Carter, um, could you just tell us about uh, a little bit more about yourself? Tell us about your journey, um, how you got to where you are in your career um, and we can kind of go from there, so. Well, thank you so much and thank you for having me. Um, I have been a forensic pathologist for uh, 39 years at, at this point. And I started out as a solo person, literally integrating this uh, wonderful subspecialty area that is non-hospital based. Um, I was very grateful that my interest was piqued by a forensic pathologist allowing me to um, shadow him and watch an autopsy when I was a high school student. And that caught my interest and I just uh, was able to focus on that. And I um, earned myself a mentor by reading and uh, writing letters back in the old days to a doctor that probably had no idea what my ethnicity was, but my interest was clear. And that was Dr. Joe Davis from Miami, Florida who mentored me until I met him face to face in uh, medical school at, at Howard. Um, what I really love about forensic pathology is that it is the greatest tool of diversity in, in medicine. Death happens to everybody. It spares no ethnicity, age, gender, income. It happens to everybody. And what's required in forensic pathology is to have an open mind, an open heart, a lot of training, and to be thorough and, and neutral at, at every bend. Um, I can't say that my journey was without any issues because when you're the first in the room and you don't look like everybody else, there are issues that you do have to uh, deal with. Um, and I've said before, I wasn't always included. Uh, there's a difference to me in being included versus being tolerated. And um, my focus was always to do thorough death investigation to present um, uh, fact-based uh, testimony in court. And because of my knowledge and experience and enthusiasm, I moved through my career actually very rapidly to the level of a chief when I was in my early 30s. 
So um, this film was excellent and it hit home um, because we don't always see things and we don't know that they're there. And uh, it was wonderfully done. Sad for me because I think when you're in a large city, you tend to think, particularly cities that have um, black colleges or medical schools like Los Angeles, New York. Yes. Oh, sorry, it looks like we uh, lost Dr. Lopes there, but um, sorry, Dr. Carter, did you have anything more to add there? Do we, uh, should we move on to uh, Dr. Lopes? I am, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, Dr. Lopes, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background, and thank you again so much, Dr. Carter, uh, for providing just a little bit of your story. Um, but yeah, Dr. Lopes, we want to turn it over to you. Sure, can you all see me at least? Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you, unfortunately. It happens when I do start video then? Okay, well, anyhow, um, my name is uh, Joel Lopes, and uh, I am uh, born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, as far as my history is concerned, I guess I would say I'm the first physician in our family. Um, so in a, in a unique situation as far as moving into this area of medicine uh, without having any, uh, certainly any uh, family members that could be mentors specifically involved in the area of medicine. Um, lucky enough to continue most of my years of practice in the Boston area as well, um, working in one of the major medical centers within the city of Boston, Boston University Medical Center. Uh, spent over 35 years there. Uh, my specialties, uh, I'm, I am a board certified anesthesiologist. I've also have a fellowship training in cardiac anesthesia, and I'm also uh, board certified in critical care. So I guess I had two jobs all the time. Um, my experience has been mostly in level one trauma. Uh, obviously anesthesia, working at an academic center. I've spent a significant portion of my career training residents and medical students and hopefully being a decent mentor to them as well. Um, and now over the last couple of years, I've recently transferred down to Georgia kind of for a change of pace. I now work in a, a relatively small community hospital where I've served as the chief of the Department of Anesthesia and I still do intensive care unit. Uh, and I would say my experience in Georgia, aside from the cultural differences of the South versus the North, <clears throat> and uh, COVID exploded on us this year, and that became quite a thing to be uh, involved in. Uh, from, I mean, I was probably right, aside from being in an ER, we're right in the middle of COVID, working in the intensive care unit, taking care of the sickest patients that got COVID. And I think that's about it, in a nutshell, from a medical perspective. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopes. And uh, Dr. Lopes actually is on call right now, so we really appreciate him being uh, available to speak with us. And uh, there may be a moment or two where he needs to step away and take a call, but um, we'll, we'll make do with what we got going. So, um, and one thing that Dr. Carter touched on that I was hoping a little bit, you guys could elaborate on a little bit more, uh, were just the challenges and obstacles that you two face along the way in your careers in terms of barriers, obstacles um, that may or may not have been due to race um, or discrimination in like healthcare and medicine. Um, so Dr. Carter, if you want to elaborate more or Dr. Lopes, if you want to share your experience, um, I'll open it up to either one of you, so. I'll let Dr. Carter go first. <laughs> I think you're still muted, yeah. Okay, uh, friends pathology is a small field as it is. And um, I, I do stand out in, in the crowd, but I think it's very interesting having been a chief medical examiner for over 30 years where you are in charge of everything, that when you uh, go to do a uh, media interview, they want you to put on a white coat because the thought is nobody will believe you're a physician if you don't have a white coat on and you're not white. <laughs> and my answer is, listen to me talk, you will understand I am a physician. And I don't always wear a white coat. My white coat signifies that I'm doing something that's contagious, dirty. That's when, when we put our white coats on over what, what we're doing. But um, 
you know, I got so used to hearing the comment uh, when people would meet you in person, oh, you're so young, because there's an assumption that you speak a certain way because of, uh, of your color or of, of your hue, which is not necessarily true. I'm from the Midwest. Everyone that I know from my area, Northeastern Ohio speaks like me. So you have those little things to uh, contend with where you're the one in the crowd. I've been literally with um, friends and colleagues at meetings and go to restaurants and they don't always want to serve you. It still happens in the good old United States of America. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing. That definitely speaks to uh, kind of intersectionality of all this too, like with your age and you say you were a pretty young chief medical examiner. So I can imagine that also created other barriers. Uh, yeah, Dr. Lopes, if you want to uh, add to that. Oh, I, it's, it's funny. It sounds like we've all had similar stories to tell. Um, and, and I guess I won't repeat that same type of story, but uh, I was when I was listening to Dr. Carter, it was reminding me of a, a situation that happened, happened to me. Uh, well, I've run into the issue of, quote unquote, you don't speak like a black person. And then my first thought was uh, asking, uh, are you trying to say that blacks don't speak English and uh, here in the United States? And uh, then they said, well, that's not what I mean. And I, I, I guess my response would have been, was, uh, that is what you mean. You're just not willing to hear what you're saying. Um, but uh, one story that sticks out in my mind uh, was a more recent story. Uh, I've been at the place I've worked at for more than 20 years, one of the more senior people, pretty much everybody in the hospital knows me by name. And I'll never forget being on call one evening and there was a bad situation occurring in one of the intensive care units. And a number of the doctors were uh, collaborating outside of the room. They were in the process of resuscitating a patient and everybody was doing what was asked of them, nurses, technicians, etc. in the room. And <clears throat> I was standing amongst a group of doctors and for starters, I was the most senior person there. I was the only person of color there at the moment and, excuse me, in, in the position with the doctors. And I'll never forget when one of the nurses walked out of the room and she had a uh, plastic bag full of uh, 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 ampules of blood that they had taken from the patients that they wanted to go to the lab. I was talking with three, if not four other physicians about what we were gonna do to try to hopefully save this patient. And she walked into the middle of the group and looked at me and handed the bag of bloods and said, take this to the lab. Um, <clears throat> my response to her was, uh, Honey, that's not happening. Uh, you, you need to go find yourself a technician. Now, that didn't bother me so much because you will always hear those kind of stories, unfortunately, in, uh, in, in the medical, in any field, uh, to be honest with you. People prejudging and, and categorizing people uh, inappropriately just based on the color of their skin or whatever stereotypes they, they try to embolden. Um, but what bothered me more than anything is when I went to the other unit that uh, everybody knows me, in, you know, by first name basis, the nurses, everybody there. And I told them what happened because I was just so bothered by it. What bothered me more was these people who know who I've worked with closely for years, decades, actually, <clears throat> were then starting to rationalize and excuse why it happened. And that's when it really occurred to me that... You know, you really can't change that, unfortunately. Um, but what bothers me is the non-guilty parties justifying that act, trying to look for excuses for it and not willing to um, take in the understanding that, wow, look what happens to us, these folks, when they're in these situations. And uh, they, they kept trying to make excuses as if to justify it. Uh, not too dissimilar to the kind of things you saw that happened with Mr. Floyd over the last year. You know, obviously not the same, but that same, always trying to find a rationalization and not looking at the fact that this was wrong. There's a reason why this shouldn't be happening. You're trying to find these other secondary issues to excuse it. And uh, I think that's what I found to be more bothersome than anything. 
Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story. And I think both of your, your stories and your experiences kind of speak to how um, internalized and subconscious racism can be and these preconceived notions that people have that they may not be aware of, but they're very real. Uh, yeah. And the, the film talks about that quite a bit too. And um, they talk about like the importance of providing examples of black male physicians for people to see and um, giving young black students like a, a role model to look up to and see like, okay, like I can go into this profession. And on the topic of the film, um, I was hoping you two could share just what were the most impactful parts of the film uh, for you two personally. And Dr. Lopes, how about we start with you this time and we'll go to Dr. Carter. I, I, I think what, what stuck with me the most in the film is, is uh, well, well, there were parts, discussions within the film that, that you say, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, I remember that. One of the things that I've been thinking about mostly from the movie is when they were talking about um, trying to determine uh, almost like how do we address this if we can't go after the cause of this. And um, I don't know if that's the right, if I understood it or interpreted it correctly, but um, it made me think a lot because I've always wondered, you know, how do we go about making people realize that they're doing it if you're going to potentially blame? Because I've, I've always thought it was interesting that whenever you talk about and refer to quote unquote racism, it looks like it sets up this wall where people want to say, it's not me, I don't do that. But in the same breath, they may be sitting back and not preventing it from occurring while someone else is, is causing it. Um, I've always <clears throat> wondered and felt that, you know, you, you can never change a racist. I don't, and I don't know if this is appropriate, but, you know, it's not the people that are racist that's the, the biggest problem because they're always, gonna, you, well, they're a problem, but changing them is probably going to be hard to do, but it's their ability to, to be empowered by those who don't see that what they're doing is causing these 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 uh, interferences with us moving forward, um, and 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 participating equally in, in society and generally, in general, excuse me. Um, whereas enlightening folks to the the things that are occurring, and hopefully, if there's a way to get them to see it and not feel that they have to defend to excuse it. Even though, they, and, and then there's that whole, well, it's not me, it's not me. And that, I think, causes, it's much harder for us, everyone, to move forward with this when people want to take on the, well, you're not talking about me, it's somebody else. And I really think those are the people who can help us, to be honest with you, um, help us all in moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Carter, if you want to expand on that. Well, um, again, I thought the film was, was well done and it spoke a truth. Um, you do need to see it to be it or to experience and to think that this actually can happen. I definitely believe in showing yourself when you can to communities so that the youngster, particularly the young people can be empowered to know I can have this, this desire. I thought the comparison of uh, athletes to um, physicians uh, was very interesting. And yet that applies to almost every uh, job career across the boards. Um, we need to expose our young people with a can-do attitude. And um, I, I can recall literally, I, I am San Luis Obispo's first full-time forensic pathologist, period. And the fact that I'm a black female uh, really has nothing to do with the fact that I am uh, credentialed and experienced and have been doing this for such a long time. But literally last year in one of the small towns in this county, I'm at a scene that's very high profile. I'm assisting and I hear a, not even a detective, but an officer ask does she know what she's doing so I stopped and turned around and I said do you know what you're doing <laughs> because I'm doing my job and this was a patrol officer and I'm like uh, no that's that's not happening I mean I'm the kind of person that calls you out because 
the truth is the truth. And it's your experience and training that allows you to do certain things. Um, but I definitely believe that by showing young people and empowering their parents to let the children explore different careers at a young age, that they can begin to believe there's nothing that they cannot do with exposure and proper training and mentoring if, if that's possible. I absolutely believe in that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And kind of expanding on what you were saying about um, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, when you two were going along in your academic careers and into medicine, uh, did you ever struggle with imposter syndrome? Like, or was there a difficulty because you hadn't seen black physicians before you or seen as many? Um, was there ever like persistent doubts of like, am I cut out for this? Um, was that something you struggled with? Or if so, how did you combat that during your training? Well, I, I would say that, um, and I don't, I wasn't familiar with the term imposter syndrome. Um, I think my parents uh, did a really good job in preparing me for the road ahead um, in that many times for my brother, my sister and I, you often heard from our parents is don't let them stop you from doing what you want to do. You have to have faith and confidence in yourself. And, and they made an effort, despite there were no doctors in my family, um, to put me in contact with some black physicians to help mentor me. And um, I think Dr. Carr is implying how, you know, being a presence for others is uh, what I think is a, is a key to doing this. Um, and, and because as you as you said, the seeing others doing it is, is misquoting you, of course, but uh, is helps you to visualize yourself in that place. And uh, those things have always made a difference to me. And I've been grateful for those who would step forward as mentors. And uh, it helps keep you in check. It helps give you information on what's coming down the road ahead for you. So if you know, even though there may be struggles, uh, you know it was coming and may, you're better prepared to deal with it when you get a little bit of good advice um, for those who've been there before us. And uh, it's always been very helpful. If I could say just one thing, which is a little off, but every time I hear us talking about this, I always think about how wonderful it has been every time I've walked into a patient's room who was African-American, usually an elderly patient, and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is this glow of happiness and this it's so wonderful to see an African-American doctor. And uh, that's, that's something I just wanted to throw in there if I could. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Dr. Carter, if you wanna um, add to that. Sure. Um, I am also the first uh, and only physician in my family. Um, I was raised very similarly with my parents grandmother always saying there's nothing you cannot do if you're trained and um, you have a desire to pursue it. So that was never an issue. Um, I did, I was raised in Indianapolis, Indiana. So there were black physicians uh, around. Our pediatrician was black. Um, however, there were no black forensic pathologists at the time. Um, and I was mentored initially by two white forensic pathologists, and it wasn't about race, it was about interest. I was a good student in science, and uh, I said I was always a proud nerd, um, but these two gentlemen mentored me. I said Dr. Davis mentored me sight unseen. However, he also made me realize that because it is a non-hospital-based medical specialty, very small, very rare, and calls for you to have a lot of extra training and knowledge. I've, I've been mentoring since I started my Friends of Pathology Fellowship. Um, I mentor students all over the world. I don't mentor them on a race-based uh, need. I, I mentor them because they have contacted me and they have expressed a desire. And I'm very proud of people I've started with in grammar school, middle school, high school, college, medical school around the world who let me know they are succeeding. Sometimes I steer them away from forensic because you might want to try something else. 
But as long as they succeed at something, as long as they know they have someone they can talk to when the road gets rough, then it lets me know you have to, you know, plan forward. Being the first one in this field, I, I always said, uh, I'm the first, but I will not be the last. And for about 20 years, I was the only, but I can proudly say now there are several Black forensic pathologists that I have worked with and mentored uh, here in Canada and Africa and Australia and uh, Great Britain. And um, along with my non-Black students, that they've had a mentor that cares about them and can share with them some of the uh, ways to get through this system and become good and thorough. And so mentoring is always, for me, it's the way to go. And the fact, again, uh, there's nothing more diverse than death. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you both for sharing and just kind of extract some of what you said. Um, it seems like there are three main things that seem to be really important for each of you. Um, one being about your parents, like really instilling like a can-do attitude in each of you and um, helping you really see yourself in these careers later on. Um, and also mentors along the way, uh, people who have reached out and help you and taken the time to um, develop you as professionals. And then um, also allies or people who aren't of color who have helped or not helped have also um, hurt and helped you along the way. With like Dr. Lopes, you spoke about um, the physicians that were not explicitly a part of the problem, but weren't acknowledging that they were a part of the problem by not doing something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so both of those sides kind of demonstrates how important it is that um, even if you're not a person of color, and this is why we recommended this event to um, all Cal Poly pre-health students, not just students of color, um, just seeing what role we can play um, in helping to kind of advance the mission of this film and uh, what this organization was trying to do. Uh, yeah, so moving on now, um, what strategies could we implement here in our community in SLO, um, but more generally just in communities around the country to start to increase the number of black men going into medicine and healthcare? And Dr. Carter, how about we uh, start with you on this one? I, I think one thing that uh, would be helpful, again, more cultural competency. Uh, you don't have a, a large percentage of black people here, period. And I think we have to uh, learn to be more accepting and, and open of different cultures and, and uh, some way to appeal to um, young men of, of color. Um, you know, for instance, I drive two hours to get my hair done. Uh, we had a barbershop when I moved here and that barbershop has closed. Um, so being comfortable in, in your skin and taking care of your, grooming needs, hygiene, um, hearing your own music or current music, things like that, uh, San Luis Obispo could, could use improvement on. Um, and then um, attracting uh, students, you know, going out and perhaps uh, having a group of individuals go out and uh, solicit information about the school, I think would be very helpful. Um. Should, should I jump in here or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was thinking about some of the things that were mentioned on the film about uh, the community getting involved in that. And I don't know the exact way how that could happen, but if you have a community, a community that does have a significant number of African-Americans in it, I, I would wonder if there was some way to get them involved in uh, bringing uh, even physicians, it's similar to this seminar that you're doing now, bringing physicians in to potentially talk to kids at the schools and 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 uh, open their eyes to the fact that the, there's black physicians out there who um, have been through a lot of the things that they've been through. Um, I recall when I first started in medicine, I made some efforts to start going to some of the inner city schools around the Boston area um, and so they could see that there was someone that was doing, had started out in Boston as a little kid and eventually moved on to become a physician as well. Um, one of the things that, that I kept bumping into when I would speak to these students is 
for them to, to grasp, all of them kept asking the same question. Well, what did it cost to go to medical school? And, and for them to grasp at a young age, the idea of taking on loans, for instance, um, and that amount of money is just seems so way out of their grasp. But it, it's easier to look at some of the other avenues sometimes uh, for a career. And uh, I, I, um, I've talked to students before who have uh, in more recent years. And one of the things I think it helps to let them know is what physicians do make now. And that, uh, yes, loans can be a, a scary thing to take on, but uh, in the end, you, you come out of it all right, I think. Um, and you're doing something that you probably will end up loving for the rest of your career, which is also a benefit of it, on top of the fact that the loans are not gonna bury you as some people believe. Um, so information on those kind of things may be of help as well. I, I was going to say, there's, there's one thing that happens at Cal Poly. Uh, they have the Black graduation, uh, which I attended the first year that I relocated here. It's very moving. The community comes out and you don't realize there are, you know, there are more Black people in the county than you realize, but they participate in the graduation uh, ceremony and they do, a, you know, kind of a, a salute to ancestors um, those from the diaspora of, of, of Africa. And, and, and that's very moving. Um, we could do more of that. Um, the other thing is you talk about financing grad school, medical school, and something that the film talked about. Um, I actually was an Air Force officer throughout my medical school education. I actually finished school with no debt. Um, and a career all, all already started because I um, accepted an Air Force scholarship based on academics because I, I looked at how I would finance school. I wanted to be independent from my family and um, I didn't want to do public health because they limited what you could go into. And I had already set up my mind to do forensics. So I heard about the health profession scholarship and I applied for it and I got it. I could have gone to any school in the country that I wanted to, but I wanted to go to Howard University College of Medicine. And um, those types of scholarships are out there. And we have to also teach our kids how to get scholarship money. Oh. Definitely. Yeah, that was definitely great advice. Uh, thank you both. And um, one thing I kind of wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, circle back to was our conversation about um, getting more students of color to go into medicine. And in the film, they talk about how important it is to uh, encourage students when they're young, when they're not just in high school, but even before then in elementary and middle school, um, really showing students then that they're capable of going into whatever career they want to. Uh, but for those students who may be attending today or watching this webinar later on, uh, who are you know maybe a second or third year in college and uh, maybe medicine wasn't on their radar, but after watching the film or after seeing you two talk and, um, or maybe just an interest that they never fully explored. Um, do you think it's too late for someone who is in their second or third year of college and they just kind of realize that maybe medicine is right for them? Do you think it's too late or um, is there still time for them to uh, make that transition and pursue medicine? It's never too late. If that's your desire, go for it. Um, you need to be able to have the prerequisites to pass the MCATs, um, catch up on topics that you haven't studied, but move forward with it. And of course, try to get a mentor, find out what you need, uh, read about it, study about it, but do it. Don't let your dream die, put some action to it. I think, I think that pretty much says it all. I know I, uh, um, I, I have at the college I went to, they didn't have quote unquote pre-med courses that were part of a major um, unless you did a specific science related course, uh, chemistry, for instance, made yourself a chemistry major or whatever, but you still had all the others to do. So you have to have some idea of how you uh, acquire the course credits that are necessary for you to move on to the testing to get into medical school. Um, it's always nice if you're aware of it in the first year, 
um, but there's many, I know a lot of people who changed uh, their idea, what they wanted to do when they finished up college, you know, second or third year, it is possible. Um, sometimes that becomes very easy to do for people if you go to liberal arts schools because they're, they're requiring that you get some of the courses anyways that the pre-med students tend to take as part of the liberal arts package, so to speak. Um, and that makes it a little easier to, you know, um, uh, kind of narrow your scope as you move along in the years of college as opposed to, you know, feeling overly committed one way and then all of a sudden realize, wow, this isn't what I wanted. You, and you put all, all your eggs in one basket and in the wrong basket. Um, I don't think it's too late as well. I completely agree with that. Um, even changing your specialty in medicine is something that you can change. I, I started out as a surgeon and uh, changed to anesthesia. I found out I liked playing with drugs, <laughs> not personally, just helping patients with the medications and the physiology and the pharmacology kind of really flipped the switch for my interest uh, with that. Yeah, no, I definitely, definitely agree that it's never too late. And uh, for Cal Poly students watching this, we have plenty of resources on campus to help you out with that transition. Our pre-health advising office, we have uh, peer and staff advisors that are, healthy, are happy to help you um, explore major changes, planning classes, um, and getting you on that track. So we're happy to help in any way we can. Um, and I do want to open up the questions to some of the attendees too. Um, so attendees, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A um, and I will uh, read them off here to the panelists. Um, but while we're fielding some questions, uh, I'll take a little bit of liberty as moderator here and just ask a question to you too. So um, in the film, uh, they talk about how, in their opinion, it was medical school admissions committees that were primarily responsible for starting to address this issue of the lack of um, black students in general, but black male students specifically uh, going into medicine. I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on whether you agree with that or if there's more to the story um, or where does, where does it all start with this kind of chicken and the egg um, issue of getting enough students ready to go to medical school, but also getting schools to accept uh, the medical students. Dr. Carter, if you want to start with that. Well, I, I agree with that. I, I think the schools need to make a concerted effort to have diversity of their uh, students and their faculty. There needs to be more respect for people of color as patients, as well as medical professionals. And what I see is there are stereotypical diagnoses that are done with people of color that are not based on physical examination. Um, there's, there's this misunderstanding that all sickle cell patients are seeking drugs versus understanding what sickle cell really does. Even sickle cell being used as a cause of death for a death in custody with physical altercation. Um, I've had cases where people, patients were disrespected and thought of being on drugs when they actually had a surgical abdomen. They have ruptured viscous, but because the stereotype was, this is a black person and they're mumbling and can't speak, I'm not gonna touch them. I'm gonna send them to jail. I've had more than one case like that. So I think the medical um, community has to reach out and recognize we need to have cultural competency we need to understand all people so that we can make proper diagnosis and treat them. And what showed up more this year than how health disparities and COVID spread through our communities? Yeah. I think one of the uh, things during the video that come through is, is how the medical schools also get caught in the, caught up in the, um, uh, perspective of looking only at grades, for instance, and quote unquote, looking for what you might call the cream of the crop based on the number one student. Um, and, and one of the things that I've observed over, over the years is you can have uh, people who go on to become physicians who supposedly had the best quote unquote test scores, um, but they're people who uh, they have to take care of and be able to develop a bond with people, not with a test. And I've seen some docs who complain, who, who like to 
boast about their uh, their scores, and I wouldn't let them touch anybody. Um, there's so much more to the, the diversity that a, I think a clinician needs to have um, that gets overlooked in a lot of times. And the, the cultural sensitivity, the cultural awareness. Um, I, I think not only that, your background that you come from. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I think um, there's a lot of, well, my perspective has been that there's a lot of Black physicians that come from inner city experiences and they can relate more to an inner city patient um, no matter what their color is actually because they're, they're more familiar with what uh, life is like and, and the way they they uh, they verbalize their concerns and their and their needs and how you can relate to them um, and, and that is a, something that is not concretely um, uh, identified as a tool for physicians and as a teaching uh, tool for physicians. And uh, that would make a huge difference, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, sorry, Dr. Carr, did you wanna add something or was that? I'm, I'm nodding my head in agreement. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I think that definitely speaks to the importance of just um, holistic admissions and not just looking at the test score and the GPA because there is so much that goes into that. And you know, how much time do they have to spend studying? Do they have um, other obligations with family or work. Um, and yeah, just like you have to really consider the whole person. I definitely agree that um, it doesn't matter how well you scored on your MCAT or your step one or step two, if a patient doesn't trust you or can't relate to you, um, the odds of them following through on the care you provide or prescribe are uh, very small. So yeah. um, one question that we had come in. Um, so this person asks, uh, I don't work in medicine or allied health, but I teach. And they're wondering what the best way for them to help is. Wow. Teach, and I wish I knew when they said teaching, they're teaching students or, um, I guess if I were to take the, the question and just interpret the teacher, I think a teacher's role with students is, is critical. I certainly remember some of my uh, teachers that uh, encouraged me to do my best. Um, I think uh, I'm going to tell his name because he was one of my favorite teachers and, and uh, his name was Mr. Page. He was a science teacher and the most memorable thing I have of him is one day uh, my friend and I took a test. My friend did worse on the test than I did and he got a better grade and his response to me is Joel I know you could have done better so I gave you the grade for the kind of work that I think you did. And he knew that that would make me push that much harder to, you know, move forward instead of goofing off and, 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 uh, and, and maybe being a clown in the classroom with my friend. And I think teachers have the opportunity to see the potential in their students for the students that they are. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I've had experiences where I, uh, I was a very good student in my time, and I'll never forget the guidance counselor, even though I was heavily recruited to colleges, telling me not to apply to colleges because I wouldn't get in them. Um, my father told me not to listen to the man, and I won't say his exact words, but uh, I can tell you that I got into every single college that he said I wouldn't when I applied. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'm glad I didn't listen to that guidance counselor because I now reflecting upon it, I think he looked at the brown guy with the big Afro and uh, didn't think I would be able to get in. And I actually got into every single school. Um, so yes, teachers play, they're, they're mentors. A mentor doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, know exactly what career someone will end up with, but certainly encouraging your students to, to you know, excel in what they can excel in and give them encouragement to try even those difficult areas. Definitely important. Mm -hmm for all students, no matter what color or sex. Mm -hmm. and just to add some further context, this is a uh, college chemistry professor here at Cal Poly. So if that helps with um, your responses. But Dr. Carter, do you wanna add? Actually, my, my mother was a teacher of uh, 50 years. Um, teachers don't get enough credit for what they do. They are training our children and they are exposing them. And I. What I liked about my mother was she would expose students to careers that they never thought of, challenge them to grow 
and give them confidence. And I think we don't give enough uh, attention uh, to what teachers have to have to go through in, in these days. Now you're teaching for testing versus helping to develop the whole student. So um, I encourage that professor or teacher to help expose their students to the wide variety of careers and not just medicine, uh, nursing has just grown up profoundly. Um, there, yeah. I think almost every office here in San Luis Obispo has a nurse practitioner that's helping because there are just not that many doctors and there are so many health um, concerns. But, um, you know, preparing that student for, for greatness and developing all the different characteristics that, that they have. You know, things that we need to learn about cultures. It's very simple. Dr. Loaf, you may have had the same experience, but, you know, in the Black culture, uh, we're taught to respect our elders. You would never come into my mother's house and call her by her first name. I didn't call my mother by her first name. But I remember some medical students walking into a patient's room and saying, Mary, and I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> you don't yeah. know this person. Give them that title of respect, Mr. or Mrs. Let them tell you what they want to be called before you make that assumption and get off on the wrong foot. So things like that that are kind of simple to think about, but it can really break a relationship between a, a physician and, and their patient. Mm -hmm. Definitely true. Okay. Great. And so we had another question here from the audience. So uh, they're wondering how medical school, and this kind of goes back to the um, medical school admissions committees. Um, they're wondering how do the medical school admissions committees take these other factors into account? So things like uh, lived experiences and circumstances they have outside of academics. Um, they're wondering if this is a barrier to diversity in medicine and does it compromise care? Um, so if you two could speak to your experience with that or your thoughts. Wow. Um, that is a tough one because I think, uh, unfortunately, each school may be different in that uh, I've been on uh, in, involved in the interviewing process for residents, for instance. And, and uh, sometimes you need to have uh, diversity within the committees, as a matter of fact, um, identifying um, differences, you know, if in the, in the uh, video, one of the things that came up is what's the purpose of the interview if you're going to look at the grades. Uh, but I can tell you that, and, and everybody is not the same, but knowing about only the grades is something that brings someone into the door more easily. And they look to make that person become part of the family, so to speak, to get accepted. Um, I can tell you when I was involved in the admissions process, uh, in Boston, I used to talk with some of my colleagues on the committee about, you need to look at what this person has been through. And the other thing that I noticed is the people who came from very financially secure backgrounds where they had the easy out, and it wasn't based, you know, I felt that there was something to take into consideration when you had someone who didn't come from having doctors in their family, for instance. And yes, I'm a bit biased because I went through it. And, and if you commit yourself to this, even if you're not the A1++ best student, you're giving all to this, plus you have everything else you have to deal with. And uh, that's the kind of person that when they get there, I truly think is also going to be more culturally aware of different people because they've been, uh, you know, lower income as well as high and, and had to know how to act around upper income people. And that plays a role in us as being good physicians to our patients. Um, and also having an awareness of how, what you need to do to be successful because you don't have a fallback if you don't succeed. And I, I, so I think those things need to be remembered and need to be coached to the uh, admitting departments of how critical it is in um, bringing a very diverse and talent, uh, strong talent pool of physicians for the whole community. Um, I don't know how you do that, um, aside from individuals making the effort to bring it to, to the forefront for everyone to consider. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carter, if you want to. Uh, yeah, I, I always encourage um, college students to really write a 
thorough personal statement. Aside from the grades, most of the uh, admission committees want to know who you are. They're looking for good communication skills. They're looking for self-confidence and they are looking for resilience because you have to be able to bounce back in medicine. You need to be able to develop rapport with your students and with your professors. So you want to sell yourself, not lie on yourself, but sell yourself that eye to eye communication when you're interviewing some hardships you have experienced, whether it's death of a loved one, um, something with your income, your goal, your desire, that's the time for you to express who you are as an individual and what strengths you are bringing to that institution. And I've been on a few committees and that's what they're actually looking for, that, that person, not just a letter grade, but a person who can then be personal and have bedside manner. Yeah, absolutely. And I, obviously you two can speak to this more than I can, but it definitely sounds like medicine is much, as much human as it is science and technical and like those um, just soft skills or more human skills are incredibly important for uh, patient outcomes. So it's not just what you know, it's how you convey that knowledge. Um, so with that being said, with the importance of um, those human skills, we do have a question regarding the MCAT. So for those students who are uh, looking to apply to medical school, do you two have any advice on preparing for the MCAT and tackling standardized tests in general? Um, if you'd offer your thoughts with that. Well, I'm happy to say that was something I had to do a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that always seems to have come up for those who have struggled with the exams is they ended up learning, and this was also mentioned in the video, it's test taking skills, rushing through the questions and maybe thinking the question's going to have, it's, it's gonna be asking you something that it really doesn't. Um, and, and so pr aside from obviously studying the material, um, practicing actually taking tests and uh, I think is a great tool. Um, the residents that I know who had trouble with their board exam, usually in the end, they all felt that, wow, it was the way I was doing the testing. Um, they, they, they all seem to know they need to read a lot, but it, and then they get caught up with the way the questions. It's a rigorous exam. All of them are. And uh, that seems to be the, uh, the consistent factor. Um. Standardized tests are a trial of, of endurance. Mm -hmm. um, I still teach the Osler preparatory course for the forensic pathology boards. And I always tell my students, number one, go back to basic grammar. Sometimes the answer is in the question. If you need to know the difference between a and in the. Um, you need to be able to, to read and focus on one question and move to the next one. What a lot of these tests do is they, they wanna get you confused and you keep hanging out with the one question and not moving ahead. You've got to make that mark, move ahead, come back to it, um, review your grammar, study alone and group discussion should be kept to a minimum. And that when you're going for your boards and you're going for your MCAT, I suggest a couple hours of studying a day, every day, but not all day long. You've got to have some measurement. You've got to free your mind up. Um, you've got to also have self-confidence when, when you're going over. And those study sessions with groups are explaining to other people. When you can explain it and you understand the basic principles, you can answer the question. Don't just try to look at old MCAT questions and memorize it because MCAT and other standardized tests function on what's current in medicine, what's current in the media. So understand the principles. That's an excellent point, it is. Yeah. It's definitely the, well, the words within the question. Great, I thank you all so much. It's definitely um, very helpful for all of our pre-med students that are here today. Um, another question that just came in, uh, how have your families practiced <laughs> your journeys in medicine, um, your academic careers? So Dr. Uh, Carter, if you want to start here. Well, I can tell you, and when my mother found out I saw an autopsy at age 14, she wasn't happy, but 
um, <laughs> she, she knew I was determined and she helped me um, just get to the library and, and read. And again, her encouragement was to do your best and to make sure that you're thoroughly trained for, for what you want to do. So my family and friends have always been very supportive. And I think it's very important when you do get into medicine that you're not going into your medical job to, be, to make friends. You're going to your medical job to do healthcare and keep your separation of family and work, keep your personal life out of whatever hospital you're working in. Yeah. Dr. Lopes, if you could uh, speak to your experience. I, I would have to say ditto, almost exactly, verbatim. Um, my family was very much proud of where I was heading, um, but um, their support was more in their pride. It was like they had given me the foundation to try to persevere, but uh, they, uh, and I guess um, I did not have them involved with me getting through medical school. I mean, when I had vacation time, I went home to family, but uh, it was uh, sitting down and focusing on the job that I needed to get done. Um, but I definitely have to give them credit for the tools that they gave me to bring to those places to work, to, to move ahead through all this. And yeah. And so, yeah, thank you both for that, those answers. And another question. Uh, just came in. Do you ever get out of debt in medicine? Was their question. So, um, yeah. So Dr. Carter sounds like you went through the HPSP. So maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that because that definitely is a great option for a lot of our pre health. I, I think it's really important while you have the opportunity to do some personal finance education. If I, I actually took a course in high school and college, so I kind of knew what I was doing. Um, but I've had a lot of colleagues that have run out and they, they buy the expensive car, they buy the big home, they don't know how to manage their patients, billing, records, all of those things. And you need to be very careful about your debt ratio. Um, you know, the certain jobs you cannot get if you're in too much debt. So, you know, you're supposed to have some delayed gratification, you know, while your colleagues have done other things and they're, they have the jobs first and, uh, you're still in school, it, you can be very envious, but you need to plan to use your money wisely because you have to do other things with that. Insurance, staffing, supplies, equipment, renting, office space, all of those things you need to be aware of so that you're not taken advantage of and you don't lose that. Yeah, Dr. Lopes, do you have things to add? Um, I would, I would say even before you get to that, I mean, things, things have changed over the years, but um, I, I reflect upon when, when I went to uh, medical school and the debt that I accrued from college medical school, um, the system has some built-in securities for people that they don't usually tell you about. I know for, uh, I don't know if it's still there now, but there were things like the government, if you have an ability to pay off a loan, they cut the principal by like 15% if you can do it by a certain time. And if there's a way to, sh uh, you know, shift things around, you have those options. You have to get educated on the kind of loans that you get. Um, physicians' salaries and most specialties are, are pretty good. And so you would be able to get rid of your school loans in some time and some good planning, as Dr. Carr had said. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, that was mentioned uh, along with uh, the, the Air Force and the military uh, support systems is there's a lot of hospitals. I know the hospital I work at, for instance, a lot of the physicians who are there just out, they, through government uh, programs, uh, because it's an area of need, the physicians, uh, uh, receive a stipend which goes to their loans of uh, to be honest it's about 30,000 a year that they get uh, that directly goes to their loans it's not part of their salary it's a complete separate payment that they the government funds the hospital fills out the, the uh, their, um, <clears throat> they, they advertise for it with the uh, hiring with it and uh, they uh, they supplement uh, money towards uh, the individual's uh, school loans. Um, so I definitely would argue there's a light at the other end of the tunnel. Um, my loans are all paid off and I got myself through college and medical school and I've had them paid off for some time now. Um, 
And the business aspect, that's the tough part. You're going to have to learn, I guess, while you're on the ropes on that. Uh, that that uh, they need, There definitely needs to be a better system for educating young physicians on how to deal with the business aspect of medicine. Great. Thank you both so much. And Dr. Carter, we have a question from a student for you. Uh, so this, she said, I'm a student in healthcare thinking about the military to help pay for PA school. Did you have second thoughts about being a woman and going into the military? Ab absolutely not. Uh, I, I snatched that scholarship up and, and ran with it and it just uh, moved my career forward. Uh, there were only two women in my group when, when I went through, we were in different specialties. But the military, uh, equal time, gender excluded, and um, those scholarships are out there. And there are so many. It's not just healthcare, but I would say go for it, do it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. And another question here. So, uh, what would you two say is? And this is transitioning now a little bit. Um, what would you two say is one of the most important reasons for? bringing more black uh, physicians into the workforce or bringing more black medical students uh, into the field? We, we need to even out this disparity in, in healthcare, in longevity. Um, we, that's one way, uh, you know, this country doesn't have a national healthcare program. In fact, one of the only industrial countries that doesn't. And we need to do our part and everybody should have the right to better health care and healthier and longer lives. And when you consider the, the title of the um, documentary, uh, one of the shortest lifespans we have are, are black males that many do not live beyond their retirement years to get social security or retirement. So there, the health disparities definitely are, have been going unchecked for too long. Yeah, Dr. Lopes? I, I would completely agree with that. Um, I, I think there's no question that there is a need. Um, we, we know that the representation of individuals is, is, is important, that you know, in the Black community, is, it's important for the Black community. It's important for uh, being able to provide better health care. I mean, uh, there's plenty of information out there showing that that makes a difference. Um, and I, I think there's just so many areas where, where the benefit occurs, it, it, not just the community, but the benefit occurs for everybody. Um, and having a more diversified pool brings more, more uh, 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 success to the goals of providing health care for everybody. So uh, it's, it's a very general response, yes, but uh, it, it, to me, I guess it just seems so blatantly obvious how, how important that need is. Um. Yeah, no, thank you both. I think, uh, I think we've certainly seen that come up with COVID too, which is with um, the disparities in COVID outcomes and also vaccination efforts. I think it's incredibly important to have black physicians to be able to interface with uh, black communities and um, have like a trustworthy individual from the healthcare sector to um, share that knowledge with them. So yeah, uh, yeah thank you both. And, Another question from a faculty member now. So uh, they're saying, as a faculty member, I think about how I can grow the pipeline of underrepresented groups at Cal Poly. Dr. Carter, you mentioned that Slow County can go a long way with developing cultural competency, which I agree with. Do you have any thoughts on how faculty can take, uh, any thoughts on how faculty can make high school seniors from an underrepresented group more comfortable with being in Slow? I, I think if there was a community mentoring program that would help, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot more minority graduates from Cal Poly that are in the area than people think and also close by. So perhaps having a community mentoring program would assist that student in knowing that they're not alone and that their goals are not unusual and uh, for that support. And Dr. Loves, if you want to add anything to that, I know you're not here in slow, but I'm sure there's still insights that you could offer. Well, I, I think a, a lot of uh, uh, larger institutions try to, uh, you know, have these mentoring programs. It's something I, I think make a huge difference. Um, it's something that we encourage at the place I was at before. 
It's uh, something we've been trying to actually do at the place I'm at now, which is much smaller, just in helping people to adjust to the area where we are. Um, I think it's invaluable. Uh, um, you know, mentoring programs don't always have to have a specific goal except to, to, except to make people feel comfortable that they have someone they can talk to, no matter what it is. Um, and, and, and once you establish that, then you can start working on those more specific, uh, we'll say academic related uh, goals in helping these people become even more successful. But coming to a new area, even if you are the one or two few of the group and, and being the only ones and not really seeing anybody like yourself makes you feel secluded. And, uh, and I, th I think uh, just that step forward is, is, is a huge difference for everybody. Absolutely, thank you both. And we have one last question here and then we'll start to uh, wrap up and we wanna be respectful of both your time. Um, so it's another student question. So is there a role for social justice in the medical field? And either one of you can uh, tackle this one. <laughs> That's a closing question. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. Is there a role for social justice? <sighs> um, I don't know if you, you can approach it from that angle. I, I wish I knew the answer to that one. Um, I, 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 I hate to put it like this, but as old as I am, I learn every day about how do I get people to understand the plight, so to speak, and how do we move forward. Um, and it's not just your perspective of what needs to be done, but there's a perspective of, of um, how do you get people to want to do it? Um, and not those who are affected, well, everybody's affected by it, but not just the affected individuals, but the affecting individuals. Um, so I have a big non-specific answer on that one. Uh, it's, it's just a tough thing. It's more just continued openness and talking. And, and I don't know if there's, there's so much social justice that can be achieved because that to me sometimes refers to things of the past. Um, a lot of people don't want to quote unquote dredge up the past, but uh, you just gotta work on understanding and then that's when you get to move forward, I think with people. It's, it's, so they don't, it's almost like, how do you help with the guilt aspect of things? People don't want to attach to that. Um, and well, I, I, I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, I know the time is, is getting late, but I have a different uh, approach. Um, I'm a medical legal specialist. That's what friends pathology is. I'm the one that testifies in court. And there is a definite role for social justice. There's, that's another reason to have diversity in my field and all the other medical specialties that we have people properly diagnosed, respected and treated as patients, but also uh, when they have died, that there's proper death investigation. Uh, I am one of the people that consulted um, with the prosecution for the George Floyd case, uh, consulting in a way of reviewing and what should and should not be in that autopsy report. It's a responsibility that we have as forensic pathologists, and it is also a responsibility to give truthful testimony to them, make sure that we have social justice. Uh, we need more social justice and people of color not being used by the medical profession, um, not being the first to get the vaccine and not having prior health care, not being the ones whose cancer cells are stolen and used for um, multiple decades, making money for federal uh, institutions and uh, local health care facilities and not being given you know, syphilis and not being treated for it. So we need, we have a lot of correction to do. And I think by having a more diverse medical population and professionals, we can help with that. There's a lot of mistrust that remains because of all the things I have just said. Yeah, thank you both so much for all your answers tonight. And I think there's a lot to take away for all of our students who are watching, our faculty members too. Um, definitely realizing the importance of not just um, our science classes as we prepare to go into medicine, but other things to think about like the, the racial and social disparities in healthcare and 
um, thinking about how can we develop ourselves as future healthcare providers to care for the whole patient and not just what's physiologically wrong with them. Um, so definitely that's something our office always encourages students to do is to make sure they make time for those classes in psychology and sociology and ethnic studies and things that might not be required, but are uh, critical for developing yourself. Um, and yeah, with that being said, um, I just want to again, thank Dr. Carter and Dr. Lope so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, both of your insights were incredibly helpful and we're just really grateful that you would take the time out of your busy schedule, especially Dr. Lopes being on call. Um, thankfully, there weren't too many too many calls while we were talking here, but um, yeah, we want to just uh, thank our attendees also for coming tonight. Uh, we want to also let you know that we are here to uh, support you in whatever way we can as far as preparing for a career in healthcare. Uh, we do have lots of resources available to you in our pre-health advising office. Um, so you can meet with uh, one of our peer, our peer advisors, you can meet with one of our staff advisors, and we'll have a slide coming up here in a second with our websites and more information. Uh, we also encourage you to go to the Black Men in White Coats website and share their mission, share their film, uh, encourage your friends and family to watch it, and really just spread this message of how important it is to increase diversity in healthcare and in medicine. Um, we also have a pre-health reading list on our pre-health website, which we highly recommend. It has books from a range of topics about provider self-care, provider patient relationship. And there is quite a bit of reading on social justice in healthcare and racial and social health disparities. So we definitely encourage you all to check that out. Um, Cal Poly Career Service is also a great resource too that can really help with exploring your career options in your major, um, maybe transitioning into a different major like we talked about earlier. Um, like both Dr. Lopes and Dr. Carter said, it's never too late. Um, so both our office and the Career Services Office are happy to help. Um, but yeah, again, thank you so much. And um, we'll, uh, we're here, like I said, we're here to help in any way we can. So thank you, everyone. Excellent. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank you. For, for coming. And thank you, Dr. Lopes and Dr. Carter, for your time tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to <clears throat> put a link to our website in the chat for attendees if they um, want that, as well as a link to our reading list, which um, our student staff has done a great job of putting together. Um, they're great books for anyone to read who's interested in any topics related to um, the healthcare, whether it's social justice or career exploration. Um, so it kind of covers the gamut for everything. So thank you all again so much for, for attending. Um, and thank you especially to, to Dr. Lopes and Dr. Carter for, for being our panelists tonight. We're so appreciative and gracious for your time. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Dr. O'Brien, did you want to add anything as we close and finish up? Hi, well, there's really not much more to add. I enjoyed this panel discussion very, very much. After I watched the documentary, especially that last scene when that young boy who was so excited about possibly going into medicine, and then when he started to share his joy with others and how we started getting taken down a peg, there were those doctors that are proud of black men in white coats who were there to sort of lift him up again, as long, along with his parents, and that's, it's this constant cycle of nurturing and re-nurturing and affirming and reaffirming. And I know it's a little bit strange, but I mean, growing up with Joel and by being at a point in my career and his career where we're sort of coming full circle and engaging with each other in this kind of environment when it wasn't that long ago, we were just beating each other up in the backyard or something. So this is, <laughs> um, we've come a long way. Sorry, too many tales from out of school. Um, but I'm so grateful for my colleagues in the College of Science and Math and the Inclusion Equity Fund and good questions, great discussion. And we will continue to get better and break down these disparities by engaging in difficult and important conversations and um, demonstrating to folks that there's more to us than our race and our ethnicity. We don't have to put ourselves into a box um, or be defined by what other people think our limitations may be. But it, definitely takes a village and a community to help people grow into professions, especially like medicine. Most people don't get there on their own. So that's all for now. And thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Bryant, for those closing comments. Those are wonderful. Thank you. All right. And thanks, everyone, so much for coming. 
Um, and again, if you need to get in touch with our office, um, we're prehealth.calpoly.edu. And if you are a student and need support, we are here for you. If you are faculty or staff supporting students on that journey and um, have questions or concerns about it, we're here for you as well. So thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.